Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to a new television series, monthly series, Caring for Ourselves and Caring for Others. Uh, we're co-hosting myself, Emily Kearns, and Stacy Hammerland. We're both from the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition, and we look forward to meeting you every Monday, every month, right here, and joining us for this conversation. Uh, today's um, session is called Caregiving Reframed, and I'm presenting um, on behalf of the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition. Uh, we have two objectives today. The first is that I share my caregiving journey with you. Um, I supported my parents uh, who live more than a decade with dementia, um, and I want to talk about the challenges that I faced, the opportunities, and the lessons that I learned. But primarily, I want to share that with you to use it as a springboard for an interactive forum um, so that we can all share our stories of caregiving and we can provide one another with peer support and most importantly with resources. So whatever hidden gems you used when you were caregiving or are using, we'd like to share those and hear more about it. In general, the television program goals is really to create an ongoing community conversation. This is your program, our program together. Um, it's about caregiving and respite um, to identify resources to support ourselves as we care with and for other people. So that's the objective of today and the series in general. So I want to start by introducing a concept that's been helpful to me, and I don't know if it is for you, but I'd like to hear more about that later. Um, for the first 20 minutes or so, I'll share some of my experience, as I said, and some of the concepts and also statistics about caregiving, and then we'll open it up to conversation. But this concept that's helped me is the concept of the crucible. Um, the crucible in general sounds uh, perhaps difficult, but for me, I found caregiving to be this really um, interesting, painful mix where we're really under pressure. And if you think of a pedestal, uh, where mortar and pedestal, where we're making spices, if you take a peppercorn and you grind it, in the end you have this incredible spice. And I don't want to sound Pollyannish about you know any of the suffering, but I really believe that the crucible of caregiving, as I experienced it, was an opportunity and remains an opportunity for transformation and also possibility. So the crucible concept has helped me greatly. And again, I'd like to hear from you later if that's something that's um, interesting or provocative or useful. And perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. Um, as all caregiving journeys, um, I went through certain stages in my caregiving trajectory, my crucible trajectory. Um, the first stage I call oblivion, kind of playfully. But in my 30s, I was starting my family, my career, and I had no clue about caregiving really, except as a parent. Um, and I had really had no idea about aging. I was in the Midwest teaching sociology as a young PhD um, sociologist, and I was teaching about gender and globalization, ritual performance studies, having a grand time. And then I would say the second stage, which most of us have probably shared, is what I call the wake-up call. I received a call in the middle of that oblivion, the great bubble, uh, from my mother saying that my father had received the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. But she told me, honey, don't worry. And of course, in that oblivion bubble, 1,500 miles away, I didn't. I had no idea what that call meant. Uh, a few months later, my father and mother came to visit, and then the wake-up call really started to uh, settle, and I really uh, began this journey of caregiving. My father came and visit, visited, excuse me, and as he always did, he went for a walk and didn't come back. He got lost in this new neighborhood. Uh, I realized after the visit that my life needed to change, that I could not support them from 1,500 miles away. So that began... Uh, you know, a real um, transformation, again, getting back to that crucible. I decided that I really wanted to journey with them. I found a job back on the East Coast. I moved myself and my family back um, to the East Coast, in fact, to my old neighborhood, which I'll talk a little bit more about, so that I could uh, show up for this crucible and this opportunity. Um, after they both passed, again, both of them had dementia, I entered the third stage, which I call recovery through action. Uh, it really had been so painful and transformative that I left my academic career altogether. This gender and ritual and performance studies seemed like play and it seemed to have no relevance to uh, the broken system that I had just tried to navigate with my family, the system of elder services um, that really is inadequate in terms of providing support for my parents. 
Now, several years later, I say that I'm in not the final stage because I think it takes us a lifetime, doesn't it, to really metabolize and integrate all that happens, you know, while we're caregivers. But now I'm really engaged with the coalition, with Stacy and others, and with many of you here in the audience, um, in trying to bring about systemic change through really leveraging our community's resources and also our personal experiences to really address the caregiving crucible, to bring resources to bear, to support others who are really in that crucible right now, and so oftentimes they feel so alone. So right now the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition is partnering with organizations across the state to grow support uh, for caregivers, um, including those who are working. We're starting to work with corporations to support employees um, as well as consumers of uh, support services. So like in any caregiving journey, and I ask you here in the audience to think about your own, the way we care give um, really is influenced by many factors, um, especially our family. And I came from, I come from what I call a village family of sorts. Uh, we're very traditional in terms of our core values. We, I come from a large Irish Catholic family and proud of it. We have core values that um, of family, especially extended family. Uh, religion, I was brought up in the Catholic school systems. Uh, respect, love, uh, and education. But my family was also unusual in that they were countercultural. By that, what I mean is they weren't materialistic at all. Um, the end goal was to be a good person and to be educated and to really have faith that God will provide. You know, so the job and money was not important. What was important is how we love. And this is really important uh, to think about in terms of my caregiving model. So I had this core value grid. Um, and what I saw around me was that my elders died in their home. My grandmother took care of her mother. Uh, my mother took care of her mother. The elders in our families died in their home. This presented me with a really unusual challenge for my family because I'm a new generation and, and as a high-powered career woman, I worked outside the home. So I had these core values, this village family, and yet I also had a career. So I was very much torn and that created a lot of problems in this crucible. Um, and like all of you, I had to make some difficult choices um, in three areas especially. In my career, um, I ended up leaving my first tenure track position. Um, tenure track for academics is really important. It means security um, and it also means uh, you know, promotion, um, but mostly stability for the career and the family. I left my first tenure track position in the Midwest to come home, as I mentioned earlier, to be near my folks. Um, I was lucky to secure another tenure track position here at a local college, so I was very blessed with that gift. Um, I made choices in, regarding my family. My husband uh, had the opportunity to work in Jakarta, a dream position, and I decided I did not want to leave my, my father, my parents, for those two years, so we commuted <laughs> around the world. Every three months we visited each other and Skyped, and I know that all of you are making these sacrifices and choices too. Very difficult to make, but very important um, in terms, again, thinking about that crucible and the transformation. In terms of my home, uh, we left our home, as I said, in the Midwest. We purchased a home uh, down the street from my parents uh, to keep them in their neighborhood and also to facilitate the ease of caregiving so I could work but come home and in my own neighborhood I would find my parents and be able to support them. So these were some of my choices and I know we'll open it up after to hear about your choices as well. We had a family vision, a plan, and I'm sure you all do too. This was our plan, this was the vision. The parents would remain in our home, in their home, as long as possible. They would move just down the street to my house when they needed more support. So they could stay in their village, they could stay near their church, and again, that was really the most important thing to them. And I could continue teaching. I thought I could teach full-time, tenure track, get tenure. It offered a flexible schedule, I thought, and I had the ability to prepare my classes and also you know, care, care give with my folks. The reality, as all of us know here in, in the audience as caregivers, the reality very seldom matches the plan and the vision, right? So that was true in my case. The family's reality was that they refused to leave their home, and I'm sure I probably will too when I'm older. They refused support services. I hired uh, housekeepers to come in, and my mother would meet them at the door and tell them they weren't needed. 
I found a day program for my father, and my mother would meet the van and say, I'm sorry, he doesn't feel like going today. Uh, she was really at the helm and did not want her daughter to be at the helm. Ultimately, what this meant was that they stayed in their home as long as they could, but it got to a point where they had to move into assisted living. The other thing that's not on here is that we actually held each other and cried one day and laughed simultaneously, realizing that we were two really strong and stubborn women and that we could not live together. And to honor each other as independent women, it just didn't work. And so they pretty much decided, even in their early dementia, they both had dementia, that assisted living would be better. Um, ultimately, after my mom fell and broke her hip, they moved to a nursing home where they lived and ultimately died uh, together in the nursing home. As you know, based on my family's vision that I just shared with you, this was not, uh, this did not meet the ideal. The decisions and the impact were huge. I was trying to, as many of you are, I know, trying to juggle work and uh, family you know, obligations. So I was juggling teaching and writing, conferences and caregiving. Um, just as an example, the day my mom broke her hip, I was teaching a class and I also was to give a paper at a conference in Boston. So I got that call, another wake up call, and what I did was I called my teaching assistant and I said, put a video in, you run the class. I delivered the paper at the conference and then I rushed to the hospital. I was called in by the dean to say that I should never have done that. I was scolded and I realized I'm just not meeting the bar, you know, in terms of the tenure track position. I ended up taking a year off, and I, again, I know some of you have done this as well, uh, without pay, using the Family Pay Act or Family Leave Act. Um, and when I returned after that year, my same dean said to me, where's your book? You were writing all year, right? And I said, kind of glibly, you know, uh, my parents are my book. Well, that was the beginning of the end of that tenure track position. Uh, they terminated my contract the next year saying I didn't have the book, so they weren't going to put me up for tenure. But you know, all of us are making these difficult decisions, right? And the thing that I realized is I didn't have much support in discerning what these decisions would mean in terms of a long life of teaching and a career life. And that's one of the things we can talk about later. How can we get support to help us discern you know, what decisions to make? Um, every family has a caregiving structure, and I know I've spoken with some of you. I'm one of six children. But there were two at the helm, right, in the end, two left standing, really, for caregiving. Myself and one of my other sisters, we divided the, the support. I did the casework, I call it, which was really the social services and anything emotional and psychological and uh, human service relation, related. And my sister, who doesn't want to go there in terms of the heart, even though she's very loving, she took care of the financial and legal. And it was a good team. Um, but you know, we had very few supports. Uh, even though we were highly educated, solidly middle class, we were fledgling. You know, we really didn't know what we were doing. Um, we, at that point, uh, I had counseling, and I recommend it for everyone who's going through caregiving to get counseling for ourselves as support. I had my spouse, who was very supportive, and I had a wonderful daughter, teenager at that time, who was also supportive and very close to her, her uh, grandparents. But work, as you heard, was not supportive. Their faith community could not get out there to give them communion or to visit, as we used to do as children. Uh, my parents' friends, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, uh, became frightened and nervous around dementia. Maybe they too, almost as a cold, might catch dementia, and they distanced themselves. Um, little from other siblings, except to weigh in <laughs> in a critical way. So, but for different reasons, to be fair. Some did not live closely, and also because every family has emotional entanglements, and uh, we, like others, also did. So really the burden lay on uh, the two of us. And in all fairness, um, I and my, my siblings will um, accuse me of this, and I honestly now believe it's true. They said I came back from the Midwest riding you know, on my white horse you know, as a knight who was gonna fix everything, and you know, I humbly say now <laughs> that I think they were right. I thought I could fix this and I had a plan. Um, anyway, through all of this, and I know that you're, you too are learning these skills, um, the Crucible provides opportunity for skill development. I'm, I've always been a fighter, but I didn't know really much about advocacy. And I know here in the audience you've written letters, you fought like hell to have your loved ones supported through institutions in the political realm. 
Um, I fought right up to the end. Uh, we learned about consumer rights. You know, I had to fire a cardiologist, you know, and the neurologist who said my mother would die anyway, so she didn't need neurological testing. Um, and also, you know, uh, I learned um, about ethics and, and the difficulty in discerning, like when to actually stop having testing. My father in late stages dementia, for example, was being tested for bone cancer. Uh, very, very difficult, painful process. And finally, after several months of this, I'm a slow learner sometimes, I realized, what are we doing? You know, and I was able as a consumer to say to the medical community, enough, we are not doing this. Um, I learned diplomacy, most importantly, self-care, and we'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. Um, and perhaps, you know, one of the most important things is presence. Um, I really had to learn, you know, how to show up um, without being stressed out. And my favorite mantra became, you know, beyond perfection is good enough. And uh, while I always sought perfection in the care for my parents, I realized that we're just all humans trying to, in most cases, do the best we can. And when that's not the case, then the advocacy kicks in, right? Um, and also I developed a business mindset. I started to feel like we are, need to be stewards of taxpayers' money, that a lot of it was not used efficiently, and I know some of you are advocating for better use of funds to support you and your, yourself and your loved ones, and these are skills that stay with me today. So that's my story, and I know we're gonna have time after for you to share yours, but let's take a step back and place my story and your stories within a broader context, because I think it's really important to look at that um, just a few years ago, a couple of years ago, 2013, uh, the AARP in their, in their uh, research found that 40 million family caregivers in the U.S. provided an estimated 37 billion hours of care. That's remarkable. Imagine if we all got paid for that. Um, the estimated value of our unpaid service at that time was approximately $470 billion. Amazing. They also learned that caregivers spend an average of 18 hours per week providing care to a family member, and I know that many of you here provide much, much more than that. That's just the average. The personal costs are tremendous. We know that more than half of caregivers feel overwhelmed by caregiving, that we're using our own money, 68% of those polled, using their own money to care for our family members. 40, almost 40% feel financially strained, most importantly, and it's just only now starting to be acknowledged, caregivers are more likely to suffer from depression or anxiety and also have long-term medical problems, weaker immune responses, um, and slower wound healing, and also mental health problems. I don't know about you, but for me, much of the 10 years, was I was really in adrenaline mode, the fight mode. And after both my folks died, I took a gap year, I call it, like the kids take. I volunteered, but my body just fell apart. And I think it was due to, in part, the 10 years of stress accumulating at a cellular level. But the workplace also is experiencing tremendous cost. And I think this is where we can start to partner with corporations to really get them to acknowledge the caregiver cost that's hitting not only individuals, but their bottom line. We have a lot of statistics from research that's been recently published. One in four workers over age 25 are family caregivers. We know that nearly three quarters of them, over 40, say that flexibility at work would help them create a better work-life balance. We know that more than half, 59% of informal caregivers have jobs in addition to caring for another person. I shared my story and I know the room is full of those stories. We know that 70% in 2009 were working at some time while caregiving. And we also know that 66% of these, those in this study had to go to work late, leave early, or actually take time off. So this means sobering business losses for our, our corporations, um, for our, our economy. Businesses lose between 17 and $33.5 billion per year, according to one study, due to the impact of caregiving on the workers. Um, there are other statistics that show that nearly 12% of uh, these 17,000 employees that were polled care for an older person. Um, most importantly, it costs the employers an estimated $13 billion per year because the caregivers incur additional um, health problems that we just spoke about, depression, mental health issues, physical issues. So it's not just the older workers, and I think that's what, something we can talk about, how to reach the younger workers as well. 
I know my daughter, who's 28, is a millennial, and she's squarely starting to take care of her father. And I know this room also is full of folks who have younger people in their family who are sharing the caregiving burden. So the last part of this presentation, and then we'll break for conversation and have a more interactive forum, is um, to think uh, in a new, uh, refreshing way about respite. The government has a definition for respite, and we've been trying to use it in our materials, and we're finding it's just deadly. So one of the respite definitions is it, respite is a coordinated systems of accessible community-based respite services. Of course, there's redundancy there, right? But for all family caregivers, regardless of age or special need. And I guess we need to talk about, like, what does this really mean? I talked to my surgeon, and I said, you know, you know how are you giving respite to your caregivers? He said, respite? What's respite? You know, so I think that um, you know, there are many problems with this terminology as we try to do outreach to caregivers and talk about respite. First of all, it sounds very medical, right? Um, caregivers don't think they need it. I don't need a break. I can do this. I didn't think I needed one for 10 years. Um, caregivers are proud. They also don't trust others to help. And again, we'll open up for conversation to think, does this reflect some of our experience too? We don't want to jeopardize our jobs. So as I'm trying to partner with corporations, I'm learning that actually workers do not want to uh, let their, um, their supervisors know that they're caregiving. They're really afraid and feel vulnerable uh, that they might lose their job if they knew, if their bosses knew the extent of the caregiving burden. Um, others, uh, let's see, the community doesn't know what it means. We talked about that already. And others are simply unaware of the invisible caregiving. So. What I'm inviting us to do today, together, collectively, and for this new TV series, too, is to think about how to reframe respite. Um, I googled the definition of respite historically, and in the 13th century Latin term, it has really interesting meaning. It means consideration, recourse, regard, look at, and see. And to me, I thought this was really interesting, because when we think of respite, or when I talk to folks and hear what they think about in terms of respite, often it means going away from. But this goes back to my crucible uh, journey, caregiving journey with my folks. One of the things I found was that I actually experienced respite when I learned to be more present to my folks without stress. So isn't that ironic? I thought I needed to leave, but actually I needed to learn to show up differently you know, without so many expectations. So anyway, I offer that for us to talk about. Um, we also need a new frame, uh, and some recent research is really interesting. Dr. Dale Lund from California State um, is finding in his surveys that uh, a break from caregiving responsibilities in and of itself isn't enough to help the caregiver, that it has to be meaningful. So he's finding that if, if folks take a break, but they're paying bills and catching up on chores, that actually can lead to increased depression. He's finding that um, if, if caregivers have a chance to go back to um, and continue activities that they loved before their caregiving kicked in, that that actually is the real respite. So if someone was able to paint or read a book or write, that that provides more meaningful respite than um, what we oftentimes think of, you know, okay, I'll go pay bills and run errands. So, we're finding the coalition that this is really helpful when we meet with caregivers, we're able to say, what do you want to do with your time off? What would be really meaningful? We know you have chores, we know you have bills to pay, but is there something that you would love? We had a focus group with um, some caregivers uh, who have children living with autism, and one of the women said, I want my nails done. And a policymaker actually said to me, nails? That's not the message we want. And actually we said nails is the message we want. Self-care that other women are able to, other people are able to receive is exactly what respite should be, you know. Not, and the other piece that we learned is that it's unique. Some people, for some people, doing the chores is meaningful respite. Other people need pampering. So to think about respite differently is really what we're about today. Um, and I invite us to think, you know, what would it look like if respite were um, integrated again, like as part of our presence in our daily sites of activity? So that someone doesn't have to leave their home to get respite. If you had respite coming into the home, you have uh, short-term nursing homes, day hospitals. These are all traditional sites for respite. Um, but they're not really integrated into our daily activities and sites. What would it look like if caregiving were seen, if it were valued, 
if respite could be found in our workplaces, in our faith places, our faith communities, our shopping places. Imagine if the Appalachian Mountain Club, you know, really reframed its marketing to target caregivers and their activities, you know, marketing them as respite activities. How about the gym or the Ys, um, Mass Audubon? We can talk about maybe other places. Um, but what I'm thinking is that how can we as a community leverage resources to reduce the isolation of the caregiver? Um, sometimes when we leave our household we're, you know, to receive respite, we're still isolated. That's not the point necessarily, is the physical departure. Um, I have some more ideas here, you know. Uh, what are the interests of the caregiver? Like getting back to Dr. Lund's um, research, you know, how can we reconnect people with those interests? Uh, so wherever we go, I think one of the things that I want us to start to think about is who's not here? Um, oftentimes in our coalition meetings we say who's here, but now who's, who's not here and why? Who, where are the isolated folks? One of my dear friends who's passed now, but he had Parkinson's. Um, he was a folk dancer, as I am. And uh, he would um, want to dance at festivals, so we ended up creating a, a circuit you know, at the festival, and we would each take like two hours with Ernie. So we could all have a win-win. We'd enjoy the festival, we'd enjoy time with Ernie, um, and we'd also enjoy time apart. But I think that's an example of, you know, where respite actually means presence, showing up for something, but in a different way, not alone, not carrying the burden, and also not certainly, you know, with the loved one away, you know, either in the home alone and we're out, or vice versa. But here we're all together enjoying this festival. Another quick story for respite is a, <laughs> is a fantasy I have. I was in Alaska and um, I met two old men, two different times, and they were sitting in the visitor centers by themselves. It's unbelievable that this was the case. And they were spending the day and I saddled up to one of them and I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm waiting for my son who's hiking the glacier. I said, when will he be back? I don't know, he'll be back at the end of the day. So folks from the cruises were getting off their cruise, leaving their older and disoriented uh, family member with, at the visitor center while they went off for hikes, multi-hour multi hikes. And I said, this is a business opportunity, isn't it? Let's start a respite program with cruises, you know, for those who can't go hiking the glacier, but let's have a meaningful activity for them at the visitor center. But anyway, it got me brainstorming about how we can do respite differently. Also in our messaging, you know, we can talk about the strain, struggle and pain, and we do, but also the laughter and joy. And we heard that a lot today when folks are sharing their stories, that part of that crucible and the transformation is also the possibility of a deep, deep connection if we're able to show up for it in a renewed state, right? Get re if we receive the respite. Um, but I fear, and what, what we're seeing is um, that if we don't rebrand respite, incorporate it into our institutions, into our communities, really we are going to suffer and our, our bottom line, our economy is going to suffer. We don't have the caregivers coming up in the next generation. We don't have the numbers. And if those millennials are stressed as they start their own families and care for the boomers, we're in deep trouble as villages and as a, an economic system. So one of the things that we're starting to do as a coalition is partner with businesses. We're doing a survey monkey, a quick online survey of employees um, to see what their caregiving burden is, and then we're hoping to respond with some of these respite ideas, uh, support groups, referrals, but I'm hoping also with more uh, innovative programs based on the interests of the uh, working caregivers. Uh, another thing is to look at the arts, right? Look at the arts. I, um, I was blessed to have a small grant and I did an art installation on dementia and it was really healing for me and my family but it also raised awareness that the family system is affected by caregiving not just the caregiver and the care recipient but the whole system um, so we can use the arts also as a to create respite opportunities um, finally and I'm looking at the time uh, we know that caregiving has an impact we all know that here um, but it's also an opportunity as I said we can seize this historic opportunity, you know, to really make caregiving a valuable uh, resource for us. It's really a flip in perspective, isn't it? Uh, to rebrand it and also to grow partnerships as we've talked about already. Finally, I want to share with you, um, and we can talk more as a group, 
Um, some of the traditional resources, um, I think part of respite needs to be uh, not only concepts and vision, but real tangible re resources. So we have the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition that Stacy and I are a part of, and that this series um, that we're start kicking off today uh, is really uh, a resource uh, for um, and from the coalition. We have the Aging Info, which is the aging infrastructure throughout the U.S., uh, well, throughout Massachusetts and the U.S. We have uh, employee caregiver supports. Uh, we also have disability resources and senior centers. But what's very exciting to me and to all of us in the coalition, and I hope we can talk about it as an audience, is some of the innovative resources. Um, Stacy and I have met with uh, two young men who have developed an app um, and they've started a business called IntelliCare, uh, kind of like the Uber taxi. Um, so you can, uh, on demand, if you have a last minute respite need, you can use this app, and the millennials will be on it. They'll use this app to find the most uh, skilled and nearest respite worker. Um, and it's quite affordable and it's brilliant. Um, we also have mini grantees that are funded through the uh, coalition. Um, every year they receive a small amount of money and we're um, following that with the impact evaluation to see what their innovations are. We have the Memory Cafe, for example, as a new model where, again, um, the person isn't care recipient and isn't dropped off for a respite. Folks come together with their loved ones and they have a great time at this cafe. So that's another way to get back to that 13th century notion of respite as presence and, and uh, regard and connection. Finally, uh, I attended a workshop on digital technology for caregivers. So there are a lot of um, additional apps to help schedule care um, and to really relieve some of the burden um, that traditionally has been on you know, the, the individual caregiver. So. Uh, We'll end this part of the show, the presentation. Um, if you want more information, you can contact me or Stacy. Um, here's my email. I'm part of the Massachusetts Lifespan Respite Coalition, and we invite you also to join the coalition. Uh, we're still taping, and hopefully you're, you're uh, interested in sharing some of your stories or some of your thoughts. What are, your, some, what are some of your thoughts and experiences on caregiving and respite? Mm -hmm. And when my daughter became ill at, in 1989, there was nothing. Mm. And um, I, as a mother, had never even thought of mental illness. And um, here I was confronted with it and did not know what was wrong with her. So for the first five years, she was hospitalized 13 times in the locked units, and I was there every single day because I wouldn't let her be alone. Mm. But she would often say to me, go home. I don't need you, and I don't want you here. So, um, of course that hurt my feelings, but I kept on going. And um, what I found out when I called the largest grassroots organization in the country, they said to me, give up all the hopes and dreams you have for your daughter and think about Denver State Hospital because that's where she's going to end up. And I could not think of Denver State Hospital. So what I had to do was I had to um, get her benefits that didn't exist. Mm. And I had to start putting myself on different committees and keep on going. And um, and I had, finally, I ended up on the highest committee in the state. And um, I was able to tell when my daughter was, um, they said, because the insurance has run out, we're going to put her in the shelter. And she was only 18, very mm. psychotic. And no child of mine goes into a shelter but I couldn't take care of her at home. So there had to be new rules, new laws, et cetera. And um, I wanted more for my girl. I wanted her to be as normal as you and I. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point in time, it couldn't happen. So um, she went into the hospital for, I think it was the 11th time. And the Department of Mental Health, she then became their 
possession. She was part of the DMH. And um, they had had much more experience than anybody else. So they put her on a new medication. And this new medication had come from, I think it was Australia to begin with, mm. then it went to um, China. But nobody was realizing that people were dying from this medication. Wow. So when it came to the United States, they put anybody who was on this medication on a national register and they had to have their blood tested every two weeks. Mm. Now it's every one week. Wow. She's been on that medication for 18 years. She's as normal as you and I. Um, she got her associate's degree. She's driving. All she right. has a boyfriend. Um, granted, the boyfriend has schizophrenia, and the boyfriend is much sicker than she is, mm -hmm. but it's been 19 years now, and, and they actually love each other. And, um, and that's a happy story. It's you know, happy. it took a long time. It took many years. But, um, I mean, I have a documentary that, I mean, I've taught 8,500 police officers into mental illness, and uh, I got $4.7 million for the Department of Mental Health on the sale of Danvers State Hospital for off-site housing. And um, it, it, I've grown. Um, not only has my daughter grown, but I've grown. Absolutely. I learned about every mental illness that there possibly is. And um, so that is a recovery story, a happy story. It is. And um, I suppose I could be grateful that my life has gone in this direction, but I never expected it. Um, I can't really think of anything that would have made me happier than to see her smile. And that's my story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. It's a remarkable story of transformation yeah. of your daughter's life and your own life, isn't it? Right. Thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name's Marsha. Hi, Marsha. Okay. Welcome. Okay. And um, my story is a little complicated. <laughs> um, I'm married, and I have two sons, um, and I actually. I've been juggling a lot of different things um, in more recent times, um, but I do have a son that's autistic. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is he's high functioning, and um, he's 38 today, and he's had remarkable um, growth. Happy over birthday the years. today! Because <laughs> um, obviously we came from a time where there wasn't much out there on mm -hmm. autism, and you kind of go by gut instinct mm -hmm. and such um, but just focusing on him for a little bit um, I mean I have another son that's about four and a half years younger um, that kind of walked the tightrope mm -hmm. with uh, needing support um, mm -hmm. he had um, attentional issues um, and we did have him on an ed plan um, but he was one of those that wanted to do things his own way, mm -hmm. you know. So he wasn't as easy to work with as the older one who was always wanted to learn and was very cooperative. Um, but my, my autistic son um, uh, did not have the diagnosis of autism till age 10. Before mm -hmm. that, um, he went with symptoms of you know, they said he had a developmental language disorder in mm -hmm. his kindergarten age bracket, and um, he had attention deficit problems. And so early on, we were able to get him on an ed plan Great. and such. So for many years, he was in a resource room. But um, anyway, it wasn't until, like I say, age 10 that the the label of autism came on there. And um, I guess I wanted to interject that it was through my church, actually, that I ended up connecting um, with a woman there. Um, we were working on hospitality for a function. 
and we got to talking during cleanup time, and we discovered we both had two sons, and there were some similar issues going on, and boy, it's like the dam broke. You know, there were no support groups in that day, time. And, um, and so we began to make this connection, and we also shared the fact that we knew of a few other moms that had, mm -hmm. you know, some issues with kids. And so we ended up forming a small um, support situation. We would get together Good every couple of weeks. And I just get into that because um, we were sharing on a lot of levels about doctors and ed plans and on and on it went. And at a certain point, um, one of the, the ladies explained how she worked for the Department of Mental Retardation out in Danvers. And um, we had been talking together, just the women, about the fact that um, why is it there's not some kind of center out there to support this? Yeah. There's all these other issues, et cetera. And so this, this man came out from the Department of Mental Retardation one night, um, and it was explained that um, he wanted to hear more of our stories, um, that he was thinking about um, submitting a grant and so we were up till like one in the morning that night. All he wanted to know are our positives and our, our negatives and whatever. And um, so he took all these notes and he went back to the center and he ended up writing a grant proposal, brought it back to us to edit and um, then submitted it and he, he got the grant, and that was the birth of the first autism center in Massachusetts, wow. okay? What a powerful story. So that, yeah. that was very exciting. But anyway, um, over the years, my son, um, his, his creative side was music, mm -hmm. and that's what initially opened him up. Um, he loved percussion stuff. Uh, he always gravitated towards the piano when people would come and play on it or such. And um, at, age, at age 10, actually, he started taking piano lessons. Wow. And, um, and we realized um, he picked up on the, the theory very quickly, because with autism, one of their biggest strengths is long-term memory and such. And he just seemed to memorize the theory so easily, and you never had to ask him to practice. And so he just, uh, you know, he ended up getting, not only taking piano lessons for four years, but he, uh, you know, got into different musical things in school and loved singing. So jumping fast forward, he's, um, now going through college, which we never thought was possible. Um, he uh, got a, a degree, you know, a two-year degree. Took him five years going part-time. And um, it was at a community college that had no experience with autism, and they didn't want to even try him, even though I pointed out positives about his learning. And so I ended up going to another branch of the college over in Lowell. Um, and they did decide to take him. I said, I just want him to try two courses, you know, something more hands-on strengths. Mm -hmm. And um, so he took a computer class and he took um, a voice class. Fantastic. And, and we just wanted to see how he would do. So. Anyway, he's, uh, today he's um, got a, a big interest in um, voiceover situation. Um, he's taken private lessons from a woman down in Watertown, actually, that had special ed background right. that was willing to, you know, work with him one-on-one -on -one, one mm -hmm. summer. And so um, we, 
after many, many weeks, the goal was to do a demo tape type mm -hmm. thing. And he went to a professional studio with her help. There was editing done, and there was background music and such brought in. But at, at the end of six weeks, it was all edited, and it, it sounded like a professional, you know. It was wonderful. Fantastic. He did windows into different ways to use voiceover. Wonderful. So, um, and he's living on his, um, in a shared living situation mm -hmm. out in Norwood. He moved out about three years ago and um, doing very well with that. Um, so I guess I should move away from that situation and also explain that um, my husband, who's now age 77, um, worked in the space industry for many years. He was very valued for his smarts. Um, he um, could troubleshoot and figure out when nobody else could. Mm -hmm. um, his background was engineering. And um, he really excelled in a lot of ways. He used to give papers and travel and such. And he worked till age 70. And about two years ago, um, after retiring in 2008, um, he fell down a flight of stairs mm. at our house and um, knocked himself out. And it was a miracle because he didn't break any bones, mm -hmm. but because he was on Coumadin, the bleeding and the bruising mm. were accentuated. Mm -hmm. And so he ended up, of course, through emergency, going into the hospital for four days and then into a short-term rehab. Mm. Um, and he had a lot of growth with walking. But in a, in a month, um, they were picking up on the fact that um, he's, he had dizziness issues mm. and balance. And um, they kept doing CAT scans periodically because mm -hmm. they said sometimes with the Coumadin there can be a delayed bleed. Right. And lo and behold, exactly a month later, it was diagnosed that he had a, a, a subdural hematoma oh, situation. Mm. And he had to have brain surgery. <laughs> and it was just really mm. scary stuff because they, I've learned with any kind of brain surgery there, they're kind of in and out of reality, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so, anyway, it's been a long journey with things, but he's now um, walking with a cane. Good. And Good. Um, mentally, he's much, much better than he Great. was. But there's still issues there where he needs support. He's going to the senior center mm -hmm. twice great. a week, which is great. He's also um, gifted with music. Wonderful. Yeah. And he, he used to sing in a barbershop chorus for years, mm -hmm. but because he developed hearing problems, he had to back away from mm -hmm. that. And um, just recently, he has started to pick up his guitar great. and start to strum it and such, but we're trying to get him out, you know, to different things, because mm -hmm. he was kind of withdrawing mm -hmm. more because of yeah. the hearing. He can't hear well on the phone and such, so, um, and, oh man, I could go on and on, but that year, you know, he had just one thing after another. He had the hearing problem develop, and he, he had a kidney stone, and just on and on it went. So 2014 was a blur. Oh, gosh. The good news is once we turned the page to 2015, things started good. to improve. That is good news. But, um, but he actually lost four people in his life very close to him, mm -hmm. and one was his brother um, down in Florida. And so... I guess I wanted to say that as the caregiver, caregiver mm -hmm. and such, um, I really, really had to be in there doing a whole lot of things for him. And um, we also 
ended up being told we were going to inherit a house down in Florida. Mm -hmm. And because my husband couldn't get in there, I had to get in there as power of attorney and so deal with that long distance. And um, house had to go through probate mm -hmm. almost a year. That's and a lot. So on and on it goes. But um, I can tell you that um, I've certainly learned a lot along the way. And um, I'm very spiritual, so I've had very good connections at church. Um, I, I've i gotten back into a healing choir. Mm -hmm. It's called the Threshold Choir. Wonderful. It's based in, at Indian Hill out in Littleton. We actually sing at people's bedsides. Oh, great. Go in small groups of three or four. And these are people that are usually depressed mm -hmm. or they're on the very end of their life, and music might have been a pulse at one point. So it sounds like you found uh, what we were talking about, actually, in terms of that Dr. Dale Lund, meaningful activities. Absolutely. That really restore you. Oh, it's You're made, both amazing that yeah. you've been able to garner the strength and the resources, yep. and uh, you know, in terms of the different stages of healing, you know, you've also moved to be advocates and uh, bring about systemic change in terms of rules. Yeah. So wonderful, wonderful role models for other caregivers, you know, who are watching today. Yeah, well, um, I think yeah. we both, nobody trains you for these jobs, I right? I know, no one and trains you just us. just learn so much. Right. And I know I reached a point, too, where I wanted to give back to others. Yep. Because I yep. always seemed to have the older child, and they were asking me. Well, I think and that's so one of the hidden gems, and we have to wrap up. Um, now, but we can continue the conversation. But one of the hidden respite gems, I think, are caregivers who are experienced with, you know, having gone through this crucible that we talked about, um, come out on the other side, yes. strong, oh. uh, resilient, uh, again, uh, warriors in a way, you know, um, and can help uh, other caregivers, you know, with what you've both learned. Standing, you know exactly more there. compassionate but you also right. have tangible skills right both of you that you've talked about and you can see how you've used that so I look forward to you joining us for yes. the next sessions and also <laughs> spreading the word um, because it will be as we said a monthly show yeah. and we want uh, to invite you to come but also um, if you or others want to present you know we'll have different topics so we look forward to making this a community uh, forum as we said before for further discussion. So thank you both, and thank everyone in the audience. Yeah, All right.